Welcome to Five Favourite Books with me, Bella Debrera. Um, today I'm talking for the very last time, unfortunately, with Greg Sheridan, foreign affairs journalist and commentator. Very sad that this is our last conversation, Greg. How are you? In, indeed, Bella. Well, I'm <coughs> crestfallen, mortified and broken up with grief and dollars. But apart from that, I'm rallying OK. How are we going to fill in our time from now on? I don't know what, what we're good, going to do. Good question. And... Um, you know, there's been such subtle arrangement of the books in our background and so on, you know. <laughs> we don't appear overly educated, but we don't appear undereducated either. It's a, it's a fine line, isn't it? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. That's um, right. So we've covered, so for, the, for, for, for listeners who might just be coming in to this podcast, so far we've had an amazing array of books. We've covered, we've had a rollicking love story and adventure with, with um, A Year of Ling da- Dangerously. We've had the wonderful painterly moving story with Maya Antonia. We've had the masterful, masterful and epic sort of honor trilogy. And we've also had the, most recently, the sort of the high, high energy rollicking P.G. Woodhouse Leave it to Smith comedy. Um, we're finishing now on a work by the great G.K. Chesterton, The Everlasting Man, which was written in 1925. Now, this is a very interesting choice. Um, where I'm sure we're going to have a, a, an, an amazing discussion about it. But I thought we should start with G.K. Chesterton, the man, who was obviously great in, in, in proportion and great in, in his mental capacity. He was a great man. So, Greg, do you want to tell us a little bit about G.K. Chesterton? Yes, uh, Bella. So, G.K. Chesterton may be... All things considered, my favourite author, really. And um, I started reading him like I started reading P.G. Wodehouse in childhood and have never stopped. He was born in uh, the mid-1870s, I think, and um, started writing seriously just before the turn of the century. Like P.G. Wodehouse, he wrote a a number of books that is just uncountable because Mm. so many of them are different uh, collections and so on. He mainly wrote about... Uh, Christianity and culture, but he did write about politics and society. He wrote novels. Um, I don't think he was at the top of his form as a novelist. He was really uh, the greatest essayist, I think, our Mm. language has produced. His non-fiction books are his most uh, important and everlasting books, The Everlasting Man, another wonderful book called Orthodoxy, but also brilliant biographical treatments of Thomas Aquinas and St. Francis of Assisi and of Dickens. He's regarded as one of the, the author of one of the great books about Dickens. Uh, he wrote wonderful detective stories where his chief hero was Father Brown. The idea yes. was that by hearing confessions, <coughs> Father Brown had a great insight into <laughs> human wickedness, so he was able to solve crimes. And Father Brown has been filmed a thousand times, became enormously successful. Um, he wrote weekly columns in Mm. a whole tribe of magazines and newspapers, some of which he edited himself. Uh, One of the great things about Chesterton was that he was a journalist. He was would always describe himself proudly as a journalist. So the two non-fiction writers, I think, who had the biggest influence on me in my life were Chesterton and George Orwell, and they were both proudly journalists who wrote books. They weren't academics who dabbled in journalism. Mm. Indeed, neither of them ever went to university which is probably why they're so so brilliant and uh, so unsullied by postmodern nonsense. Uh, Chesterton was larger than life in every way. He was an enormous person in today's uh, uh, tonnage, I suppose you'd say he was about 140 kilograms or something. Yeah, great, he was 6'4". Uh, he was 6'4 and 130 kilograms. Yeah, and um, he, he had a very happy marriage, but they couldn't have kids. And so he was a great uh, friend of everyone else's kids, nieces and nephews and and everybody else. And he wrote about everything. You know, he wrote wonderful columns, many of which have been collected. Wonderful book of his called What's Wrong with the World. Isn't that a great title for a collection of columns? Where do you um, begin? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And he was, um, his style, sometimes you can feel it's like it's a bit too much sugar in a cup of tea Mm. it can Mm. and it drives some people mad he was the master of paradox everything for chesterton was a paradox so he he always delighted in the apparent contradiction but discovered the deeper unity Mm. somebody said of him um, that he was as dull as ditch water and he responded by saying, what a very narrow view of ditch water. Don't you know that <laughs> ditch water teems with life? There are more microbiological life specimens in a stream of ditch water than you'll find 
you know, wait for age in any other um, any other solid uh, solid bit of um, uh, of the earth. And um, he was great fun, and he uh, got into a, a couple of serious disputes in his life. But normally he was a very good humoured disputant, um, and he was just one of the great characters. He died when he was about sixty three or sixty four. Uh, very amazing that a man of that size who drank as much as he did, very convivial guy, um, mm. should he have made it Puritan, through to his sixties. He? he certainly he wasn't, wasn't a Puritan. He certainly wasn't no. a Puritan. No, I think no I'm, the, I'm amazed that he actually lasted that long. When you look at the, the photographs and the size of him, and he clearly was not a healthy, not a healthy individual. But it's, he uh, had a great miraculous. life force. There was a great vigor about mm. Chesterton, even though physically, um, as he got fatter, it was harder for him to get around. Mm. But like he used Orwell, to make. Sorry, Sorry he used to make jokes at his own expense too, quite often about his size, didn't he? Wasn't his, Oh yes, the, the, all the time, yeah. yeah. And um, and uh, P.G. Wodehouse, uh, one of his great lines was that uh, he said something made a sound like that of G.K. Chesterton falling on a tin roof or yes. something. And uh, Chesterton greatly admired Wodehouse. And um, I think it was um, Bernard Shaw, uh, Chesterton's best friend was Hilaire Belloc, also a pretty solid character. Mm. And Hilaire, um, I think Bernard Shaw labelled them the Chester Belloc, as if it was some terrible, uh, you know, monstrous uh, creature. And of course, he was like a cricket umpire too. He'd have jackets and coats and great coats and everything, and all of them would have books in the different pockets. Mm. So if he ever had a minute to spare, he'd pull out a book and be reading it. Very eccentric and absent-minded, so he'd get caught reading a book. Very often had to send his wife a telegram, am in slough. Mm. Where ought I to be? Because he'd forgotten what his evening engagement was. Uh, and she'd usually say home. That's right. She'd usually say home. <laughs> and, of course, his, his wit was endless. He, he once he decided to move out of London and he, he thought he'd just get a train and see where it, where it stopped first. Mm. And he said, I boarded a train which had as its first stop Slough, which seemed to me, he said, an eccentric choice even for a train. And... Uh, <laughs> He once he once wrote a foreword of his to one of his books, and he said, um, uh, "You know, this book is designed to appeal to certain types of people, but I find the human race, of which so many of my readers are members, has the following <laughs> deficiencies, uh, and so on." He was a bit like Wodehouse in that he was extremely jolly, yes. and although he wrote about the most serious subjects. Uh, he always had a sense of humour and and a love of the humour in nature. Uh, and perhaps perhaps this why explains why he was able to maintain friendships with, well, we can talk about this f- famous people, but p- people who were on the other side of the uh, probably the the moral and the philosophical uh, li- line or debate. So George Bernard Shaw and and H. G. Wells, um, they never agreed on anything, but they remain. They both, I think, at least Shaw remain firm friends. They remain firm friends their whole lives. Particularly um, sure. But, but yeah. what you say is true generally, Bella. He, he was very promiscuous in his friendships and um, he never regarded anybody as a bad fellow just because they disagreed with him. Orwell didn't like his writing, but mm. Orwell got some of his earliest journalism published in, um, in GK's Weekly. Which, so Chesterton took over a magazine which I think had been run by his brother, and whatever it was called, they convinced him it would sell better if it was called GK's Weekly. Mm. And that's where Orwell got some of his first journalism published. We think of Chesterton as a conservative, but like his friend Belloc, he was actually a British liberal. And so in politics, he was a liberal and in his way quite radical and um, certainly not a, uh, you know, not a person of privilege or uh, or anything like that. And um he got into a couple of bad disputes on behalf of his brother, where he made a few lasting enmities. But mm. generally speaking, he was uh, he was a friend to all. And actually, his friendship—well, he's not his friendship, but his interactions with with um, H. G. Wells brings us into nicely into the book, um, because um, I think, as you'll explain, he wrote *The Everlasting Man* in response to a book that H. G. Wells had written. How how, how true is that? Is that Something yes, that that's, that's, read on that's the internet. Right. That's fake. That's 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 false news, or is it? Was it no, no, no. That's ab- that's Wells? absolutely true. And of course, he and Wells and he and uh, Shaw certainly 
used to be like a travelling vaudeville act. They'd go and have debates in towns mm. and so on and people would pay good money to come and hear them. And Wouldn't you just love to go... Wouldn't you just love to use H.G. Wells' time machine to go back... <laughs> that's right. <laughs> ..to and one of those right. debates? That's right. And uh, and then they'd go and have dinner together afterwards and, they'd be, yeah. and they, they were the best of buddies and they sent each other Christmas cards and all the rest of it. Isn't that um, what what we're missing these days in, in terms of debate? Isn't, isn't that what is completely absent from from our our national debate these days where people there, there are a couple can't of, do this. Well, that's true. Although there are a couple of my antagonists uh, in public debate who I get on with pretty well and um, and uh, have no um, have no trouble, you know, breaking bread with. Mm. I wish I wish we would do that more often. Mm. But that's right. H.G. Wells' book was an outline of history and it is completely forgotten now. It is justly completely forgotten. Mm. So Chesterton wrote... A Christian outline of history, which he called the everlasting man, but it is only a response to H.G. Wells. It's not, um, as you read the book, you know he doesn't refer to H.G. Wells chapter by chapter and say, "Now I'm going to answer this bit." The book has had an extraordinary history. It's still in print, uh, so it was it was uh, published as you say, 1925 or 26. So just about just under a hundred years ago, it's still widely in print. You can get it in any. Christian bookshop and a lot of other bookshops as well. Uh, it was the book which C.S. Lewis said converted him to Christianity more than anything else. C.S. Lewis has a lovely passage about it in his memoirs. He says, if you're going to remain a conscientious atheist, you have to be very careful of what you read. God lays all these traps mm. for you, like leaving the everlasting man around. Lewis read the everlasting man and just had a crisis of faith mm. in his atheism. Ross Douthat is, a, um, I think, the most brilliant contemporary Catholic writer. He's a columnist for the New York Times. He's written some wonderful books, Bad Religion and To Change the Church and so on. Brilliant younger Catholic voice. And he, he did a little list for his readers recently, I think, of his six favourite, all-time favourite um, Christian books. And The Everlasting Man was there, and he had a lovely line about it. He said... If you can cope with Chesterton's loosey-goosey treatment of history, um, you'll find that he'll seduce you if if you go with him. And do that has captured something quite real about Chesterton there. This is not a scholarly book, and yet it's profoundly well informed mm. uh, by great reading. But Chesterton doesn't try to make a serious sort of um, scholarly assessment of anthropological causes. The book. I'm giving you this in a rather confused way, Bella, but the book, um, which I was profoundly influential for me, has really two core propositions. The first proposition is that man, humanity, is unlike anything else in the created universe and has not changed much, so that humanity is distinctive, utterly distinctive, nothing to do really with the animal kingdom, and utterly universal. Human nature is utterly Mm. universal. There's no difference between ancient man Mm. and contemporary man of any consequence. That's proposition number one. Proposition number two is that uh, Christ and Christianity are completely unique amongst the world's religious consciousness and um, comparative religion or historical religion. There is nothing else which makes the claims of Christianity and no other human in history who makes the claims of Christ. And to illustrate the first proposition that man is both um, utterly distinctive and universal, Chesterton spends the first chapter of this book dealing with the caveman. Mm. So what do we think we know about the caveman? We think we know that the caveman was a brute who used to beat his woman over the head, throw her over his shoulder and take off with her. And there are typically hilarious Chestertonian paragraphs we don't know why we think that of the caveman, you know, and um, we don't know why the cave woman was so devoted to spinsterhood <laughs> that she had to be beaten over the head to, you know, elephants and hippotamuses can conduct their romances much more peaceably than this. We have no evidence that the caveman was so violent, but that seems to be our proposition. And he takes lots and lots of propositions about the caveman and then shows that there is actually no evidence from them from the cave. But what do we actually see in the cave? We see cave paintings. And what do the cave paintings tell us? They tell us that ancient man was an artist. 
and rather a good mm. artist. There are very clever qualities to these paintings. And um, Chesterton suggests you couldn't really have painted the deer and the antelope with quite the sensitivity and uh, if you didn't love the deer and the antelope. And then there are technical things in the cave paintings, such as painting a, a deer which tries to turn its head. And that's the ancient caveman challenging himself technically. And then what else do we know about him apart from the fact that he was an artist? Well, if he did indeed live in the cave, there in his living room, he'd hung a painting. So what do you know about the caveman? He was an artist and he liked to have paintings in his living room. He sounds pretty familiar, really. And I must say, the first time I read that, it was quite revolutionary. And this is a typical Chestertonian moment in an image. So Chesterton does elucidate the argument, although he does it very cleverly and very funnily. But what he's really done with one image is completely demolish an entire mm. field of academic speculation that um, somehow or other primitive man was really primitive. Whereas we know in the things that really count, the human soul, he was a human being. And um, Yes, and he's also, he said art is the signature of man, didn't he? So that was... Art is the signature um, of man. And, and, and the, art, the art is interesting. His, his interest in art is interesting because I think he studied at Slade, the School of Art, didn't he, in London for a while. I think um, studied probably overstates it rather. But well, he, did, he was enrolled. He, he was enrolled and he, he, he went there once or twice and he loved to draw. Initially, he, he thought he would be an artist. Yeah, He did illustrate, was it one of Belloc's books? He illustrated one of Belloc's books as well. He did. He illustrated some of his yeah. own books. And, and um, some of his own. His drawings have a sort of childish uh, charm. exuberance about them and charm. Yeah, but they don't. But he, chose, he chose the right career, didn't he, by not, by not pursuing uh, Oh, that. he absolutely did. Yeah, he absolutely did. But, 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 um, but, back, but back, to the, back to that's an interesting, as you say, it's an interesting point. You don't think that, that the two images are irre irreconcilable. The image of the caveman clubbing the woman over the head and with the grunts and sort of dragging her into the cave or, you know, adorning the walls, literally putting a, putting a painting on his walls. It is quite, it is quite an arresting Image. Yeah, and, um, and Chesterton's not arguing against evolution as a theory of the physical development of humanity, but he is arguing against it as a theory of the development of the human soul. Mm. And he says, you know, there are lovely, hilarious passages. He says, the you don't see the higher animals doing the lower art. Um, so a, a dog does not do a better sketch than he did when he was an uncivilised jackal. He still can't do a sketch at all. He still can't draw. And, um, and he said, you don't find that the sketches are quite good in chimpanzees and then they're just a little bit better mm. in human beings. Mm. Actually, there's nowhere to be seen in the, uh, in the, in the chimpanzees. And, um, if you give chimpanzees a, bowl, a, a bucket of paint, you get a sort of um, Jackson Pollock I think. That's right. You get Picasso or Jackson you get Pollock. Picasso you don't get anything Pollock. you'd like to you look at. You know? <laughs> and there are lovely lines, you know, from Chesterton, he says, you don't find wild horses being impressionists and domesticated <laughs> horses being post-impressionists. You find the caveman painting the deer, you seldom find the deer painting mm. the caveman. And what he's arguing is that humanity is completely distinctive from, um, from the animal kingdom. And actually, the more we know about contemporary science, the more that is really borne out. There's a wonderful book by an Irish philosopher and theologian called From Big Bang to Big Mystery. And it brings every anthropological thing we know right up to date. And there's still no explaining human consciousness, art, ethics, morality, religion. And, and also he mentions um, the reactions, unique reactions that we have, such as shame and laughter that... that yeah, uh, there's no, no other... Uh, Chesterton loved humour. He was a funny man himself. Mm. His writings are screamingly funny. His comic verse uh, is, is just wonderful. But um, he points out that, uh, of course, mankind is distinctive in his creativity, but he's also distinctive uh, in his laughter. In Brendan Purcell's book that I was just referencing, he makes a point which Chesterton doesn't make, which is that the most primitive burial sites we know... Um, have artefacts which the dead were to take with them into the afterlife. So we also know that the most primitive human beings believed in God and believed in an afterlife. And um, 
So the idea that that somehow or other humanity just emerged by a physical accident from, you know, the swamp that was there before just doesn't really add up to the science. And um, there's another lovely line in the book from Chesterton. He says, the greatest feat of imagination is the imagination required to see what's in front of your eyes. So this is what we can see in the cave. Mm. Before we go on to our crazy speculations, mm. let's actually deal with what we, what we can actually see. So that half of the book, which argues that humanity is utterly distinctive in nature and that human nature is absolutely universal. So a human being 50,000 years ago was no less a human being mm. than the human being of today. And obviously a human being of any race is no less a human being than any other race. That's a wonderful Chesterton. And really, when Chesterton gets into your bloodstream, you're then kind of immune from the sort of silly um, kind of, you know, academic silliness, which would argue that somehow or other, you know, um, um, a dolphin uh, emitting a noise in the ocean is the same as Shakespeare writing Hamlet or something like that. You mm, know. Mm. Um, and on that point of... Um peculiarly unique aspects of being being human being human beings is obviously religion which which um, leads us which which leads us sort of into the next um, as part of the book which is his his idea that um, religion is as old as civilization and he says civilization is as old as history and and it's religion that has advanced civilization um, so we need so human beings, are advanced and unique because of religion, and religion has progressed civilization. It hasn't. It, it's the opposite, I think, to what H. G. Wells believed, which was it was religion was a retardant that it was something that was holding society back. I think that's true, Bella. Except I'd I'd say Chesson didn't altogether believe in in progress. There's a, I don't think I can locate the quote, but he says there's a part in it where he says civilization didn't come after barbarism. Barbarism and civilization coexist always. From the very earliest moments, there were civilized human beings and there mm. were barbaric human beings. Mm. There are civilized human beings today and there are barbaric human beings. But he does regard the appearance of Jesus Christ as the great dis disjunction in history. Mm. But his passages on, on um, comparative religion are marvellous, absolutely marvellous. They wouldn't be academically sort of... Um, absolutely rigorous but for example he says most mythology actually does acknowledge a higher being so he's talking about some american native american mythology and the sun marries the moon and their children are the stars and so on and then the the indian myth has it and this was ordered by the great spirit and so many mythological and seemingly poly polytheistic religions acknowledge somewhere that there's a great spirit. Then, of course, he says many things that are called religions, like Confucianism, mm. are not really religions at all. They are seeking a good order, and in a sense they're seeking the truth, but they don't make any very great claims for their metaphysical truth. But then Christianity comes along, and there is no other, there is no other experience in the history of human religion, no other person makes the claims of Christ and um, no one else claims to be God no one else claims to be mm. God and it seems to fit the world it seems to fit the world so he says in part to sum up the sanity of the world was restored and the soul of man offered salvation by something which did indeed satisfy the two warring tendencies of the past which had never been satisfied in full and most certainly never satisfied together it met the mythological search for romance by being a story and the philosophical search for truth by being a true story. So he's quite specific about the historicity of Jesus as well. So Christianity is not like Buddhism or Hinduism or a lot of other very ancient religions which hold their myths or even traditional Roman religion hold their myths as it were in a time before man, you know, a kind of a mythical time. Uh, Vishnu and Shiva and, and so forth, or the, or the gods Thor and Odin and so on. Mm. You can't falsify these gods. They, they, didn't, uh, they didn't exist in a historical time. 
Christianity is very specific, and Chesterton, very much like Orwell, loves the concrete, the specific, something you can actually touch in your hands and see with your eyes. And uh, so Jesus is a specific historical character. And then he's unlike any other um, religious leader. Muhammad doesn't, uh, I'm not saying anything disrespectful of Islam, but Muhammad doesn't claim to be God. Mm. Um, you know, the uh, none of the Indian gurus no, claims Buddha, to Buddha be God. Buddha never claimed to be Buddha God. Buddha certainly yeah. doesn't claim to be God. And, um, and then the story... Chesterton also makes very Catholic claims for Mary because he says you can't approach... Christ was also God when he was a child, but you can't approach a child except through the mother. And there are very funny passages about um, when certain brands of Christianity didn't like statues of Mary and the child, and so they had to try to chisel the child out of the mother so then they could have just the statue of Mary, mm. which he says seems even more Mariolatrous yes. than, uh, than, than the reverse. Yes. And he says, but of course, you couldn't chisel the mother out of the story of the child. Mm. You couldn't have the infant mm. without having the mother there. So he, he loves the incarnational mm. aspect of Christianity, the true, the true flesh and blood. But he also says that, in a sense, myth had been the search for truth. Christianity was the deliverance of the truth. And it's a, it's a radical uh, claim for Christianity. And of course, full of Chesterton's wonderful uh, wonderful romance. Um, Bella, I mean, you must stop me if I'm going on too much, but one of the great elements of Chesterton's treatment of Christianity and something that was a very profound lesson for me was that Christianity is a human story. I think Chesterton famously said, famously said it's a poem, not a syllogism. And it has truths which can be stated in an abstract way. But every truth of Christianity is balanced by every other truth of Christianity. And Chesterton used to argue that a heresy is not a denial of the truth. It is an obsession with one particular truth at the expense of all the other truths. And in his other great book of Christian belief, Orthodoxy, mm. he has a beautiful image about uh, what Orthodox Christian belief is. He says, Orthodox Christian belief is like a wild Roman chariot veering to the left and veering to the right, always reeling, but somehow or other just remaining upright while the dull heresies lie sprawling and prostrate. So he had a sense of the dynamism of the church because it was a living institution and how every truth of the church has to be balanced against every other truth of the church. Submission has to be balanced with charity and, um, uh, you know, love of one's neighbour has to be balanced with um, love of one's family, love of God and love of neighbour. If you just concentrate on one thing or the other, you'll go crazy or you'll go wrong. And, which, is, uh, which is a sense you get when you look at the, the very early councils <clears throat> and the, of Nicaea and, and, and heretics like Athanasius and, and, and the very early, early days of, 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 the, of, the, of the, the church where they were trying to sort out heresy from non-heresy. And the heresies weren't, as you say, they always had an element of the truth because that's how they, take, they took hold. Um, yes, but you do yeah. get that sense of the living, the living church very early on when it was trying to when it was trying to work out what was what was the truth and what wasn't and um, and you know I think that's something that that I don't know if, if um, Chesterton talks about that period in his in his in, not in, in not in this book, man, but there is nothing about which Chesterton hasn't talked no, somewhere I'm sure or other. Did. So uh, he so, certainly, and of course he loved the feast of Cana because. Jesus turned water into wine. What a great <laughs> yes. use for water, Chesterton thought. This is great. And what he a great argument liked... against teetotals. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, Chesterton was certainly not a teetotaler. <laughs> he also loved the, uh, the Marian aspect of the Feast of Cana. There is Jesus at the wedding. His mother says, look, they've run out of wine. And Jesus says, okay, well, what's that got to do with me? It's not my fault. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. And she says, well, you know, it'd, it'd be nice is. if you could do something about it. And he says, Mum, look, it's not my job, okay? And there's a plan. I'm, it's not my time yet. You know, I'm only 12 years old. Give me a break. Leave me alone. And he, the mother says, okay, well, you, you know, you please yourself. But, you know, that's mm. what your mother would like. Mm. So Jesus, a good Jewish son, says, all right, all right. <laughs> this is what mum wants. Okay. And all the wine appears. And... This, so the divinity of Christianity is 
the divinity of Christ is not absolutely neat, as it were. He mm. responds. He's fully human as well as fully mm. divine. And he responds to his mother quite rightly as a, as a, as a loving son. He's obedient. Son. Yeah. yeah. And that's humility. Well, Obedient and also he yeah. cares for her. Mm. You know, he, he cares about her. Right at the end when he's dying mm. on the cross, he says to his disciple, this is your mother. Mm. You know, in other words, look after her. Now, I, I mean, Bella, I don't want to be sectarian about this in any way, but Catholics, of course, extrapolate these passages out into their whole theory of Mariology. And and Chesterton was very devoted to, uh, to Our Lady. But mm. nonetheless, um, he doesn't write in a sectarian Catholic way. As I say, the everlasting man. And Chesterton had been a Catholic for decades by the time he wrote that. He was, so he's a convert to Catholicism. Mm. That's the other thing about him. I think his parents were Unitarian or something. And he briefly, as an adolescent, rebelled against all religious uh, belief and then came back to a very orthodox version of Anglicanism and then uh, ultimately became a, became a Catholic. Mm. But there's a universal and jolly quality to his writing which has, um, you know, made him hugely popular with non-Catholic uh, Christians as well over the, over the years. Do you think um, there's something in the the optimism that attracts people to it still? I mean, it's it's um, it's a it's a difficult life as we all know, <clears throat> and it's full of suffering and pain, and we're all weak, and you know, the human nature that we're all sort of um, burdened with. But but Chesterton manages to remain to to keep his humour and keep his optimism, and um, I I think the story of as you were saying, the story of, of that people that appeals to people is is the the story of Christ and that that whole strangeness and and Chesterton talks about how it's just it's such a strange story. That, oh yes, that his entire life was just getting ready for a sacrifice, um, and and it's it's just really odd, but still very optimistic. And and I think is this something? Do you think? Is why the book is still in print, which is why a hundred years later, or it's it's still being read, it's still being discussed. There's still people giving lectures on it, and oh yes, and so much of Chesterton is still in print, and certainly optimism is critical to it. Not a silly optimism. I mean, Chesterton was very Irish in a way. The situation was desperate, but never altogether serious, mm. and um, and he was quite clear-eyed about the difficulty of things. He lived, I think, to about 1933 and he saw Hitler come to power and he understood straight away the evil that was Hitler and he denounced Hitler straight away. And um, uh, he, he certainly uh, could look evil in the face, but he was a tremendously good-humoured and optimistic in his temperament. And um, another one of his great lines was that uh, Christians are entitled to be optimistic. He talks in one of his books um, about how often the church has been defeated and should have died. And he says, but the church keeps coming back. Maybe this is because it follows a God who knows his way out of the grave. Mm. That's a very characteristic Chestertonian mm. formulation, you know, a God who knows his way out of the grave. And um, Chesterton writes at times about God's humour. And he says, perhaps God's humour is so great that he masks it from us because it's, uh, it's too... Um, it's too great for us to cope with. Um, as I say, we think of Chesterton as a conservative, but he had a very liberal way of putting conservative arguments. So can I give you a paragraph of Chesterton on tradition? So Chesterton is a great defender of tradition, but not, not really like Edmund Burke as tradition providing order. Mm. And he's not a defender of tradition like a traditional conservative saying that, you know, lords are rightly in their place and serfs are rightly in their place and so on. So he has a, this chapter, but he loves tradition for the common man. And he argues, tradition means giving votes to the most obscure of all classes, our ancestors. It is the democracy of the dead. Tradition refuses to submit to the small and arrogant oligarchy of those who merely happen to be walking about. All democracies object to men being disqualified by the accident of birth Tradition objects to their being disqualified by the accident of death. And yeah. uh, the final, let me give you one, one more Chesterton aphorism. I mean, he's like Wodehouse. You can just quote There's him so forever. Much. Yeah. But one of his um, observations, which has gone to my heart and which I have lived my life by, this is the key Chesterton observation, which, and it's the only one that I can say I've lived up to fully. And it is the most consoling and splendid insight of Chesterton. 
And Cheston was a very happy warrior. He was full of, you know, involved in lots and lots of controversies, always very jolly about it. And he commented, anything that is really worth doing at all is worth doing badly. Uh, as opposed, of course, to not doing it at all. Yes. And uh, uh, this this is absolute Chesterton, you know, better to go out and, um, you know, plant your crop, build your house, marry your wife or husband, have some kids, do your best, you know. Uh, Just keep trying. Yeah. Just keep trying to do your best. It seems to me, though, that you've done a lot and you haven't done any of it badly. So I think <laughs> I've done you might have failed. Badly, you might have failed. You said it was the one thing that you think you achieved. <laughs> but oh, no, I don't no, think you've done no, anything no. badly. <laughs> no, no, well, you know, we won't get into that, Bella, because we want to spare everyone their blushes. But, yeah, no, I've done plenty. You know, there was a there was an effort recently to try to get uh, Chesterton um, made into a saint. Mm. And nobody loves Chesterton more than me. And there is a worldwide movement of Chesterton fanatics, you know, there's a marvellous journal, the Chesterton Review, which I've contributed a piece to, an international journal. There is a movement of Chesterton high schools in the United States. There's a number of schools devoted to Chesterton. Chesterton is the moving spirit behind Campion College uh, Mm. in Sydney. And Carl Schmuder, the founder of Campion College, is the head of the Chesterton Society in Australia. But Chesterton was a journalist. And I thought it was utterly ridiculous to try to canonise a journalist. Utterly absurd. And Chesterton himself would have regarded it oh, as a dear. complete joke. And the church very sensibly said, we love Chesterton. He's one of the great teachers we ever produced. But, There's but no the- question of his cause going forward for canonization you know i don't think he performed any miracles i don't think he i don't think well that, people uh, say they've prayed to you know for his intervention and and got it and so on but he certainly didn't see himself he didn't really no in that way at all no. and we ought to discuss too the one thing that is typically brought against him which is a charge of anti-semitism mm. and um i think the things that he wrote about jews would disqualify him from sainthood In my view, Chesterton was not an anti-Semite, but he did write in the period that he wrote, and he had such an organic concept of Christian society. He thought England was falling apart slowly, so he was a great critic of modernism. He he understood the crisis of modernism very early. It's impersonalism, so his political philosophy of distributism was to distribute Mm. power and property widely and stop it from getting in the hands of a small class and so on. But he also thought that West European societies ought to be Christian societies, which didn't mean they had no room for outsiders at all. But he became a kind of a Christian Zionist. So he wanted the Jewish people to prosper, but he agreed with them that they'd prosper best in Israel. Mm. Now, his brother, I think, was an anti-Semite. And the only bad episodes in Chesterton's whole life Uh, where he got involved in his brother's disputes. Mm. And the only people he ever felt truly angry with were people who injured his brother, who died quite young. And um, so Chesterton got into disputes with some Jewish uh, financiers, and he wrote about the Jews and the money interest. Of course, this was pre-Holocaust stuff. Mm. I mean... He certainly didn't want anyone ever to be persecuted or to be denied the franchise or to be expelled from the country or anything like that. And as soon as Hitler rose up, he was condemning Hitler instantly. I think he was his... condemning Hitler quite early on before... Before, before he got before, to power. Before he yeah, got to power, yeah. When Hitler came on the scene, and the one and one of the main things Chesterton condemned him for was his anti-Semitism. And... Uh, If he'd lived a bit longer, he would have been a great defender of the Jews of Mm. Europe. But nonetheless, so you can't really find a remark where where Chesterton says an out-and-out, utterly anti-Semitic thing. But you can certainly find remarks where he generalises. In a way, he generalises about everybody. Mm. You know, the Irish do this, the Mm. English do that, and the Spanish Mm. do that, and so on. And he agrees with the Jewish self-assessment that they are a race as well as a religion, and then he talks about races in a quite airy way. You know, the Japs do this mm. and the, the Brits do this and, and so forth. Nonetheless, having said all that, having made all the allowances and so on, I think he said some silly things uh, about Jews. And um, people who love Chesterton, as I do, have to recognise that he 
he got a few things wrong. And of course, anyone who writes, let me tell you, as someone who writes kind of two and a half columns a week, if you write that much, you make mistakes mm. even on your best days. I mean, Chesterton was opposed. This will uh, appall you, Bella. It's an obscure thing. Mm. Chesterton was opposed to female suffrage because he thought the woman's role in the house was so magnificent, so majestic, she shouldn't be bothered with, with, with trivial politics. rubbish like voting. And uh, the passages he wrote in defence of this utterly ridiculous yeah. position, yeah. so his position is utterly absurd. The passages he wrote are among the most beautiful passages on the special dignity and place mm. of women and the special role of the mother and why would you give up providing a whole universe to a child in order that you could get on a Clapham omnibus and provide a single vote to a wretched politician, this sort of thing. It's all lovely stuff, yeah. but it's also mad. Yeah. Yes. You know, you have to yeah. recognise it's yeah. just crackers. So um, so there was an element of that. And Chesterton would have been the first himself to say, you know, he changed his mind, not on fundamental things, but on all kinds of other well, uh, <clears> unlike um Unlike Churchill, he didn't marry a, a, a great... Um, he didn't marry a suffragette. So perhaps no, that's for no. and he, reasons um, why, didn't she? That's right, that's right. It was a very happy marriage and he was a completely considerate husband. I mean, he didn't do any cooking or anything, but he never... <laughs> he never. He did, he did the eating, but he didn't do the cooking. He did the eating, but not the <laughs> cooking. But he never provided his wife with any grief, you know. I mean, he wasn't... You know, fame well, didn't from... lead him to carry on with other women and he didn't no. misspend the money or, you know, spend it on... on uh, gambling and he didn't mm. you know he's devoted to his wife he was deeply deeply devoted to his wife she might have got a little bit frustrated with having to having to uh, rescue him from from odd train stations he was a very impractical but, person she had yeah. to organize his whole life you know didn't not she, only didn't, rescue didn't him didn't she have to uh, um put his address inside his jacket didn't she didn't she have to write where he lived inside his and and, and pin it to his jacket so that he Either he knew, or if he was found, they could find. They find could, they could direct him home. And in in P. G. Wodehouse, there's a wonderful short story where somebody is in um, Paris, I think, with Bertie Wooster, and goes out and gets lost and can't remember the name or address of the hotel mm. that he lived in. And you'd think this is completely implausible until you realise this happened to Chester and <laughs> time without number, because being absent-minded is really a paradox. It's not that your mind is absent, it's that your mind is focused. So he would be focused mm. imaginatively on Dickens or Thackeray or Thomas Aquinas or something like this, and he'd forget that he'd gone 16 stops over where he was supposed to get out from the train. But his wife even had to organise, you know, she had to tell him to eat. I mean, he was so fat you would you'd think that would be the last <laughs> thing, but she'd have to tell him to go to bed, she'd have to tell him to have a bath because he'd just kind of... He gave the practical side of life yeah, just to her. Completely, completely impractical. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and the, the other great thing is, like all good journalists, he wrote partly because he needed the money. Now, he didn't need the money just for himself. His estate was substantial when he died because of such vast royalties. So he left his wife well provided for. But he was supporting a thousand good causes at mm -hmm. the time. So he's always trying to support a magazine which others thought was uh, was important politically. And he was supporting good causes and individuals who had fallen on hard times. He was very free uh, with money and very generous. And um, some people have argued this is a pity because when Chesterton was free of editing, he wrote more books. And if he hadn't had all that practical uh, difficulties, he would have been an even greater writer. I don't agree with that at all. I think when history gives you a genius like Wodehouse or Chesterton or Orwell, you can't argue against the circumstances mm. that gave rise to the genius. And part of Chesterton's genius, I think, derived directly from being a journalist. So he was always dealing with the most profound and long-term issues, but journalism made him deal with very practical day-to-day -day yes. issues. Yes. So he hated yeah. the way working class people were treated in the courts and he wrote columns uh, attacking that. And he was always up with affairs because he had to do weekly columns. You know, he's doing half a dozen weekly columns at a time at times and he had to produce his weekly magazine and see what people had written about politics and court cases. So he didn't always get his judgments right about... Um, so in the Boer War, he was rather sympathetic to the Boers, not because of any action they took against black Africans, but because he thought it was rather 
arrogant of the English to tell the Boers how to live. Mm. He always tended to be on the side of the um, the of underdog. the underdog yeah. in any in any given uh, in any given dispute. So I think being a journalist and needing the money, thank God he wasn't a rich aristocrat who could have just spent his time writing beautiful lyric poetry or something. You know, so he had really, to get out it, and get published. It was really necessity. So it was a combination of necessity and and the journalism made him more of a well-rounded, not wanting to use a pun to describe him, <laughs> a well-rounded right. individual. Well um, said. He certainly was well-rounded. <laughs> <laughs> It, um, it, it got him in touch with concrete reality. Yes. And that yeah. was his great strength, like yeah. Orwell. In Orwell's great essay, Politics of the English Language, there is a great essay on, lesson on how to think. Orwell says, never go straight away to abstract terms. Always think first in the concrete and only go to the abstract when you have to. And this was a prejudice he shared absolutely with mm. Chesterton. So the greatest non non-fiction writers we've ever had. Orwell, like Chesterton, I think, was a much better essayist than a novelist. Although Chesterton wrote one great novel, The Man Who Was Thursday, mm. which changed the course of English literature. But both of them dealt with the concrete first. So what they were interested in was how did, how did men and women live really? And they found this out by talking to men and women and being in mm. their homes and so on. And this was infinitely better than being in an Oxford college dreaming mm. of how ideals might have might have lived. Another line of Chesterton's was, there's nothing wrong with the w- real American. The ideal American, however, is utterly horrible. You know, he thought uh, <laughs> the only thing wrong with America was its ideals. It? The ideal American was awful, but the real American <laughs> was very nice. That's very that's a very Prince of Paradox thing to say, really, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. The, the man who was Thursday, if you want to digress there for a second, um, Chesterton's greatest novel... It's a very uneasy novel, and it kind of introduced surrealism into English literature. Uh, Thursday, the conceit is that there's this club of anarchists. Each anarchist leader is named after a different day, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And it turns out that all of the anarchist leaders are secret policemen attempting to infiltrate the anarchist circle. And... uh, so the whole anarchist movement is actually is actually policemen run by the secret police <laughs> against their own knowledge, trying to be good anarchists, uh, except that one of them is actually the devil. And whereas most of Chesterton's books, even his novels, are very jolly, and the Father Brown stories are wonderful, mm. Agatha Christie style detective stories, The Man Who Was Thursday is a very disturbing book, and somehow or other, as you read it. You know, he doesn't tell you what the conceit is. I've spoiled the plot for anyone who hasn't read it. Uh, but it's a very uneasy thing. And it, it had an enormous influence on writers who were not as good as Chesterton and who went straight to surrealism. Mm. It also had one huge influence in history. Michael Collins, the Irish revolutionary reader, read The Man Who Was Thursday and he thought Chesterton's typically Chestertonian paradoxical idea of hiding in plain sight, mm. you know, the place for mm. an anarchist to be, is in the high street wearing a suit and no one will think mm. he's, uh, he's out of place. And that's what Michael Collins did in the war against, in the Anglo-Irish war between the Easter uprising of 1916 and the declaration of an Irish free state in 1922. The British didn't have a photograph of him and he, he modelled himself on uh, the characters in the man who was Thursday, quite uh, quite explicitly. Did so, Chesterton know that? Did did was that something that Chesterton found out? The answer is I'm not sure, but I think so mm. because Collins was very open about yeah, it, and yeah. uh, and Collins came out in 19 you know 21 or whatever when mm. he negotiated the peace with Britain. And Collins was a moderate, unlike Eamon de Valera. He mm. negotiated a peace, and he ha- he had an Irish civil war to enforce the peace and to live up to his promises to the British. And he was very open about the debt that he owed to Chesterton. I think Chesterton might have felt a little bit ambivalent about it because <laughs> Collins was an extremely successful guerrilla leader. Mm. You know, he, he waged a war which brought the British to their knees and forced them to leave Ireland. He made the cost of their being in Ireland too great. Chairman Mao is um, alleged to have studied Collins and studied something of the influence of the man who was Thursday as well. That, so, is, a, that is the strangest connection I... I think you could have possibly made on this podcast a connection between yeah. Chesterton and Chairman Mao. That is, Isn't it bizarre? That is yeah. so bizarre. That is so it shows bizarre. how great writing has a life yeah. of its own, though. You, you can't tell where it's going to go or who's going to read it or what, uh, 
or what happens uh, what happens with it you know so in in summary i suppose why would you count everlasting man as as your in your top 5 favorite why does it make the cut well bella it was a very difficult choice it, there had to be some chested in there so i said to you last week the writer who influenced me most of all was pg wodehouse in my general outlook certainly the writer who influenced me intellectually most was Chesterton but because his central outlook was in a sense so similar to Wodehouse's so similar in temperament just one of tremendous good humor and good cheer isn't life fun what an adventure Mm. in the old Aussie slang you wouldn't be dead for quids would you it's just so much fun Mm. you know and uh, there's nothing to complain about really there had to be something from Chesterton like Wodehouse I began reading Chesterton or I mean like I began reading Wodehouse as a very young kid, I began reading Chesterton very young. And of course, there's lots of nonsense verse and so on. A lot of stuff in Chesterton is very easy, very easy to get hold of uh, as, a, as a kid. Mm. And then even his greatest works often have a simplicity to them. Um, that's part of his genius. You know, the most accessible book on Thomas Aquinas is Chesterton's biography. And yet it's also Aquinas scholars, Etienne Gilson and so on, the greatest Aquinas scholars regard Chesterton's distillation of Aquinas as the most piercing that anyone has ever produced. And so then there was a a contest of which Chesterton. So I loved his autobiography. In his autobiography, he says early on, I believe my name is Gilbert Keith Chesterton. I have no evidence for this. It's pure oral tradition. I've seen no... So there he's making again a point about how we actually rely Mm. on oral tradition. Mm. It's just what his parents told him, you know. So all the arguments against the church and so on are too much oral tradition, but tradition is generally Mm. right. I was very tempted by orthodoxy, which is his statement of his personal belief. I was tempted by the collections of his journalism, like What's Wrong With The World. Wonderful. Uh, Like Orwell's um, journalism, I write as I please. These were newspaper columns for the ages, screamingly funny, but making a deep point. But The Everlasting Man, I think, makes the most profound case in a way that is very, very accessible. There's a, some of Chesterton's mannerism and some of the elaborateness of his paradox. You've got to get a bit used to it. And then when he talks about what the Celts did in prehistory and what the Hindus did in prehistory, it's not academically rigorous, but it's broadly sound. He's not, you know, he doesn't attribute things to Brahman philosophy mm. that are that are not connected with Brahman philosophy. But... As I said to you earlier, Bella, it makes this very deep case that humanity is utterly distinctive and utterly universal. And that case was challenged in the 20th century by the Nazis. It's being challenged now. Mm. I had a a debate on TV with Peter Singer, the atheist philosopher, very good person, very decent man. I'd make no personal criticism of him, but a very useful atheist philosopher because he takes uh, his philosophical proposition to their logical conclusion. And he, was, he has argued that uh, profoundly handicapped babies should be allowed to die um, because they have less utility than a sentient mammal like a dog or a, or a cat or something. And I said to him on this episode of Q&A, we were both on, or he, he said to me rather, he said, Greg, you really mean they should be kept alive just because they're members of our species? <laughs> and I said, yes, that is exactly what I mean, because they are human mm. beings. So the first half of this book, is, is really the most wonderful humanist case for the true universality of all human beings. And then the second half of this case is the most... The second half of the book is the most wonderful case for the distinctive claims of Christianity. Now, you can reject the distinctive claims of Christianity, you know, let it be said that some of my closest uh, human associates are not Christians, but... Um, but nonetheless, you can't reject them by saying they're the same as all other religious claims. Uh, you can't make Jesus out to be a kumbaya social worker or even more ridiculously as a revolutionary political leader. He is a man who claimed to be the son of God, the Messiah and the second person of the Blessed Trinity before Abraham was, I am. Uh, I saw Satan fall from the sky like lightning and so on. The claims of Jesus are very explicit. And Chesterton really deals with these claims and explains them in history. And uh, Chesterton loves history much more than philosophy or theology Mm. because he gets to philosophy and theology 
through the specific. I think the great artist always gets to the universal through the specific. Through the specific. Yeah. And Chesterton loves the specific. So it's a little bit of work for a modern audience to get past Chesterton's mannerisms. But I agree with the New York Times columnist Ross Douthart. And of course, it's a rollicking ride. It's great fun, full of Chesterton's terrific jokes all the way through. There are three good jokes on every page, which is which is more fun than you'll get in most mm. theological reading, let's, uh, let's face it. And I think if you read it from start to finish and you still think Christianity is rubbish, then at least you've made a considered mm. decision. But you'll get, you'll get closer to the core of Christianity in this book, I think, than you'll get in any other book. Yes. And like Wodehouse, he's just um, an endless mine of great quotes, you know. And sometimes I quote Chesterton, I never pretend that his words are mine, but I sometimes quote him without attribution mm. because it looks too lame to be quoting him all the time, you know. So <laughs> another of his it's, great it's difficult lines... difficult not to. It's difficult, it's difficult not, not to. to. Another of his great lines is, when a man be- ceases to believe in Christianity, he doesn't believe in nothing. He believes in anything. Mm. And mm. how true is that of so our true. age that we're, so living in, uh, that we're living in now? So I don't That's... think anybody... It's only 250 pages long. I don't think anybody would... Uh, feel at the end of it that they wasted their time um, well yeah. then i think i think um perhaps that the sales might go up after this podcast <laughs> who knows but it's been a pleasure again um and Thank i've learned a lot i've learned a lot over the last five episodes it's been an absolute joy and and i and i um i encourage people to read all the books that we've talked about because Thanks there's much, so much Bella. to be so much to be gained from all of them and thank you so much for your time Thanks so much, Bill. I've enjoyed it so much. I mean, to talk about these great books is uh, is so much fun. But it does bring out the Fidel Castro in me. You know, I can go for nine hours without <laughs> interruption. But it's been terrific, Bella, and thank you so much for it. Sign up today for only $55 and we'll also send you a free copy of the first book, The Year of Living Dangerously by Christopher Koch, which will be signed by Greg and myself. Plus, you'll also be invited to a very special online town hall event that we're having in August, where you can ask Greg any questions that you have about his choice of books. I'm so excited to be sharing this new series with you. For all the details, head to ipa.org.au.